So uh, yeah, hi everybody. Welcome back to to Deep Rob for discussion nine. Um, what I'm planning to do in today's discussion uh, was um, kind of maybe a similar theme to what we did in the most recent seminars. So based on the fact that uh, the the sense from the class was that project three is stressful, um, this is going to be a relatively short discussion in terms of the slide content. Um, and then I'll use it for office hours so that I can hopefully resolve questions before the weekend. Um, in terms of extending the project, uh, what I'm planning to do now is to extend it to, to Tuesday, and then that'll be the, the final extension um, because uh, it seemed, so that, that's that's the current plan. Now, if at office hours today, there's a lot of more stress, then I will take that into account, but the, but the plan is for Tuesday as the final extension. Um, so that's that's the current plan. And in today's discussion, so yeah, like I mentioned, it's going to be relatively short so that we have time for the, the extended office hours so we don't leave here too late. And the topic is going to be on object tracking. So it's going to be looking in anticipation of next week's seminar topics. And uh, before we get into it, I'll take a second to see if what administrative questions I can answer. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so the question was, for the quizzes, which are starting next Tuesday, quiz nine next Tuesday, uh, how should you prepare for it? What will be on it? So any of the ideas that were covered by the presentations in the seminar are fair game. Um, so there are not gonna be questions that like dig into the appendix of one of the papers and try to get at the really nitty gritty because that wasn't covered in the class. But if there were questions that were covered in the class, so um, like, let me try and, sort of think of one like off the top of my head. So for example, um, like in the case of like normalized object coordinate space, like that presentation, one of the concepts that was covered is like, what is the normalized object coordinate space, right? So it's that unit cube in 3D space where you would map every single point on the surface of the object geometry to one of those coordinates in the 3D space. So questions about that, about that representation would be fair because that was covered in the, in the class. Um, and so in terms of how you can prepare for that, I would recommend like going back to the slides or your notes that you took from those seminars and uh, and reviewing those. Um, but otherwise, uh, it'll be similar to kind of like the quizzes that we had in the in the first half of the course. So the same time limits will be in place um, and it's the same policy. So they'll open at, I think we said at 7 a.m. and then close right before the class starts. Thanks. Any other and any other questions I can answer? Okay, so yeah, so this weekend I will um, publish also the like the final project spec. I'll fill in the, the remaining three sections to help clarify that. And, um, and yeah, okay, so let's get into object tracking. Um, so, so next week's seminars are going to be focusing on object tracking. And so there's these two um, broad sub uh, kind of areas within object tracking that we're going to be focusing on. Uh, in this course. So in seminar five, which is going to be on Tuesday, we're going to look at using recurrent neural networks or potentially other forms of fusion within networks um, to actually perform object tracking at the at the instance level. Um, so what that's going to look like is in the case of like pose estimation, uh, what we'll potentially do is fuse predictions from the network uh, and try to then use them across like those predictions that were fused across time to actually estimate the pose at every single timestamp within a sequence. Um, so deep IM and also pose RBPF are forms of, of fusion in that in that way. Uh, but then also looking at at other forms of tracking we can do. So for example, like tracking key points as opposed to exclusively the pose and how those can be used for ultimately pose tracking. Um, but then also the XMEM paper then is more of like a pure vision based, more recent paper that um, I think will be an interesting one to look at. Uh, and then in Thursday's lecture, we're going to extend the topic of, of object tracking to be how the robot could it could track essentially itself as a rigid body object within space. So visual odometry is the task of taking in visual data along with generally there's um, odometry sensors on the robot itself. So like the encodings on wheels, for example, within the robot that would say how many revolutions the wheels have taken throughout the course of some trajectory um, and try to fuse those, those pieces of information to estimate where the robot is precisely within the space of the world. So that's visual odometry um, to be used for localization. And so there's been um, kind of this, this, what I think is a really interesting um, branch, branch of work that's formed that tries to take classical 
uh, model-driven robotic algorithms like the Kalman filter, the particle filter, and make them end-to-end -end differentiable so that you can train components of those models using neural networks. So Backprop KF uh, was one of the works that did this with the Kalman filter, differentiable particle filters, did this with the particle filtering algorithm. And then those ideas have extended outside of just localizing um, uh, robots within like a planar scene or robots within an autonomous vehicle scene to include um, running these sorts of filters on multimodal data. So the third paper, multimodal sensor fusion, tries to use these differentiable filters for fusing disparate um, sources of information, so both visual information, but also tactile information. And then differentiable SLAM net is a really interesting one that actually looks at the SLAM algorithm, so simultaneous localization and mapping, um, and tries to use a similar approach. So try to make this model-driven algorithm be end-to-end -end differentiable so you can train components of it, which in the past would have been handcrafted by a robotics engineer. So that's what we're going to be looking at next time. And so then the, the rest of today's discussion is sort of meant to just sort of set up how it is the ideas that we've been talking about are going to extend into this object tracking uh, scenario for sequential data. So last time, what, what we were really looking at uh, and in the past kind of few weeks, we've been looking at 3D perception, and then more recently, how we can represent rigid body objects that exist within these 3D scenes. Um, and so the, the seminars that we had this past week were focusing mostly on pose estimation, um, but there were also papers listed on the website where you could represent maybe like the surface of a geometry, um, like a rigid body geometry, as, a, as an implicit representation that's sort of baked into a neural network. And so given this, the basic setup for all these models has been, we have some visual data coming as input. We pass that visual data through a deep neural network, and then we get out some object representation. So this could be a pose output. This could be a key point representation output. This might be a surface representation output if you're doing some sort of maybe like a rendering network, um, similar to like, like that ISDF paper that we saw. Uh, but this has been the framework. So we have like this static observation. We pass it through a network, and we get out then a static object representation. But there's a, a big question then, which is like, how can we extend these ideas to sequential data? Because our robots, which what we want them to really perceive is the scene as it's changing and as potentially they're changing it. So there's a few different ways that we might be able to do this. So the first approach that we could potentially use is what might be called like a frame by frame estimation method. So the idea here is if we now have sequential data, let's take the exact same neural network that we have and let's just apply it on each frame as, as our robot collects them frame by frame. So for per performing some pose estimation task, what that would look like is we have our first frame coming in as input, here's the robot. We run our deep neural network and maybe we estimate the position of the torso of the robot in that frame. The next time step, we get a second image and then completely ignoring the computation that we just did previously, we'll rerun the same network and get a new pose estimate for this second time step. And then this would keep going on throughout time. Um, and hopefully our network would be well enough trained that it could just estimate the pose perfectly well on each individual frame. Um, but the, the limitation here is that you're not fusing any of this kind of temporal context that you have access to on the robot. So in other words, you're not uh, allowing the network at each individual time step to know what the previous observations in the scene uh, had, had, uh, had been collected by the robot. And so that's, a, that's a, like an inherent limitation. Right, so like inherently, this frame-by-frame -frame estimator would be ignoring a lot of the uh, information that a robot actually has access to, assuming that it can collect this sequential data. And so what we might want to do to try and improve our model's performance is to actually incorporate that information, to fuse that information across time. So historically, uh, the model-driven approach to a lot of uh, robotic applications has been to apply some filter over time. So those Kalman filters, those particle filters, what they're doing um, in the at kind of like the core of them is they're trying to fuse information across time. So the idea which we could try to use within uh, within deep learning would be to say, let's take a frame by frame estimator network. So maybe it's doing pose estimation or key point estimation, and then let's just filter at the very end the the raw outputs that we get from our network. So for estimating key points, maybe we could smooth the key points by averaging them across time steps. Or maybe what we could do with our networks is we could try to learn a residual. So like a delta from the, the key points at the last time step to the new key points at the current time step. Um, and so that's a way of trying to fuse information across, across time. The downside with this approach is that any fusion algorithm that you define is going to be limited based on the specific state 
representation that you choose. So the network is not really getting to sort of learn um, a potentially like unbiased state representation, which might be beneficial for this fusion. Instead, any algorithm that you're going to be coding here is going to be limited by whatever state representation you're choosing. So in other words, if you choose to represent your pose, let's say, as a quaternion and then um, a translation vector, any filtering algorithm can only only has access to that information. It has access to the quaternion representing the orientation and also the, the translation vector. But it doesn't have access then to maybe velocity in either translation or orientation. So then you might say, okay, well, let's add velocity as well to our final state estimate uh, that we get from the network. But you can see how if, as you try to maybe produce more and more complex filtering algorithms, um, you're making the problem potentially more complex for the network in ways that the network might not be good at learning or it might not be clear how to set up a loss function for those specific outputs that you want to include in your filtering algorithm. So a different paradigm, maybe a third idea that we could try, is to actually allow the network to learn what representation is useful for fusion across time. And so this is the idea, my real core idea behind what are called recurrent neural networks. Before we get into recurrent neural networks, um, any questions on those first two ideas, like the frame-by-frame -frame estimator or like the late fusion approach? Okay, so, so the core idea behind recurrent neural networks is exactly what we just said. So what we're gonna do is we're still gonna have some observation coming in at, a, at input at each time step. We'll pass that observation through a deep neural network, but now that neural network will be expected to output two separate things. First, it'll be expected to output some hidden state, which you can think about as being like a sort of memory. So it's like some summary or description about everything that the network knows up to this time step. And then in addition, the network should also output a, um, a like a raw output that might be the, the actual object representation that we're interested in. So this would be your 60 pose or your key points or your surface geometry. And the key now dif distinction between recurrent neural networks and the previous neural networks is that we'll take this hidden state, which is actually like a tensor that was output by the network, and we'll use that as part of the input to the next time step when we call the neural network. So now this next time step within the neural network, it has access to a new observation coming from our sensor and also this hidden state memory that can be used to modulate the actual activations within the, within the network. And so using these two pieces of information together, then it can output potentially a more well-informed final object representation output um, to use as its final prediction. And so our hope then is that if we train these neural networks across an entire sequence, so if we actually perform back propagation using labels for every single time step within the sequence, um, the goal then will be that hopefully these hidden states become meaningful for performing tracking across, across time. And so all of the papers that we're going to be looking at next week are going to be using this core idea of how to model sequential data, um, but they're going to be doing it in various ways. So the papers like uh, Pose RBPF and Deep IM, they're going to be performing more of what we would consider like I the idea number two. So where we perform some late fusion but still use a, a deep network representation. So those are going to be taking output from a, from a neural network and then trying to modulate that output using some classical filtering algorithm. Um, another way you could maybe think about that is modulating a classical filtering algorithm using neural network output. Um, but those are going to be those two papers, um, and then. Similarly, the, the papers on human pose estimation and then there's some on robot pose tracking um, are gonna potentially be performing a late fusion and some of the works perform a, kind of like that mid-level fusion. Um, but then for the visual odometry and localization, all of those papers are going to be using recurrent networks. And so they're gonna be, um, they're gonna be trying to use recurrent networks for out, either modeling where the robot's position is at every step in a sequence or they're going to try to use the recurrent network to map a scene that the robot's in and localize the robot at the same time. And so that's what we're going to be looking at next week. And that's a very brief discussion so that we still have, I think, 30 minutes that we can talk about uh, any questions on the project. Um, so yeah, this is just like a very brief overview of how we're going to be using recurrent networks for modeling sequential data. Um, if there's questions on... On these, I can I can try and answer them, but uh, then I'll try to use the rest of the time for for office hours questions. Okay, cool. So I don't see any questions, so let's get into uh, the office hours. <laughs>